Welcome everyone to Bitcoin Optech newsletter number 301 recap on Twitter Spaces. We're going to be talking about Lamport signatures on top of ECDSA signatures today. We have a PR review club meeting that uh, covers Bitcoin Core's transaction orphanage. And we have our regular releases and notable code sections, including some PRs related to package relay. I'm Mike Schmidt, contributor at Optech and executive director at Brink, funding open source Bitcoin developers. Merch? Hi, I'm Merch. I work at Chaincode Labs. I've been doing a lot of BIP reviews. Ethan? Hi, I'm Ethan. Um, I'm a cryptographer that works on a bunch of different stuff, um, but sometimes I do some Bitcoin core development and I love thinking about um, uh, protocols and Bitcoin script. Awesome. Gloria should join us later and she can introduce herself then. We're going to jump into newsletter 301 and go sequentially here. Starting with the news section, we have one news item titled Consensus Enforced Lamport Signatures on Top of ECDSA Signatures. Ethan, you posted to the mailing list titled Signing a Bitcoin Transaction with Lamport Signatures. No changes needed. And it sounds like there was some discussion of OpCat and Lamport signatures and that maybe we don't need OpCat for Lamport signatures. Maybe we could achieve some quantum resistance and Andrew Polster is talking about BitVM covenants. Maybe, Ethan, you can help us out here. Where where should we begin? Sure. So uh, this all started um, when I was um, uh, uh, writing the OpCat BIP. Um, people were um, uh, asking me lots of questions about opcat and lamport signatures and quantum resistance um and so i ended up having this conversation at the dci um at the mit digital currency initiative uh like thinking through some of this stuff um and during that conversation i realized that um while uh while generally you need opcat to build lamport signatures in uh uh in Bitcoin, um, there is uh, you can build Lamport signatures um, uh, using Jeremy's old trick from 2001 to sign 32-bit values like these uh, math values. Um, and so, thinking through that, it was like, well, what can you sign? Um, and there's not that much that you can you can make a 32-bit value. Um, it's like so. It's like, well, what if you could sign a signature? Um, then you could kind of sign the transaction hash and make the spending of a, um, a Bitcoin output dependent on um, like a, a Lamport signature that signs the spending transaction. But how do you take Lamport signatures, um, which uh, uh, probably I need to explain, um, and uh, ECDSA signatures and like sign an ECDSA signature with a Lamport signature? Um, because, uh, and so the thing that I realized is that the, the 32-bit value that you can extract from a lamp, uh, from a ECDSA signature is the size. So if you call op size on the ECDSA signature, you'll get its size and the size, um, varies sort of with what's signed, um, in a, in a random way. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot more details to the way in which it varies, um, but if you do some clever tricks, you can kind of make the signature um, size sort of a um, sort of depend on the hash of the spending transaction, um, and then you uh, can sign that size. So you can sign the spending signature is fifty nine bytes long, or the spending signature is fifty eight bytes long, um, and if you do enough signatures. Um, you can uh, amplify this uh, the security um, uh, offered to uh, cryptographic um, uh, uh, levels. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of assumptions on this, and I want to be like very upfront. Uh, no one, like no one, should use this uh, unless they really understand what they're doing. Um, and this is very preliminary, um, but uh, you could. Um, you could use this to basically get Lamport signatures in pre-tap script um, outputs, um, uh, basically using the size of the ECDSA signature as a proxy for the ECDSA signature, assuming some other things are also true and fixed about the ECDSA signature. So the variability of size of the signature is is the the trick here, the fact that that 
occurs naturally. You're, you're taking advantage of that in this protocol. Exactly. Um, and this is not true with um, how Schnorr signatures are encoded um, in Bitcoin. So it's like one difficulty for using this trick in TapScript is Schnorr signatures are either um, uh, 64 bytes long or 65 bytes long. And the only difference is whether you include a uh, the SIGHASH flag byte. Um, uh, but and the easy to say signatures in Bitcoin Basically, they truncate the zeros. <clears throat> so an easy to say signature in Bitcoin um, consists of two parts, the R and the S. Um, and uh, they both, uh, like if there's a bunch of zeros out in front of the number, they'll just make it shorter. So if you think about this almost like proof of work, and there's some really early schemes, which are super fun that people did back in the day of... Um, like essentially grinding signatures to get lots of zeros so that their size would be smaller. And then having like a rule that like this transaction could only be spent uh, if this if the signature is shorter than this, um, forcing someone to do an enormous amount of work to spend that signature. Um, but you have to be very uh, careful because the R value, we know that there's an R value <coughs> which has lots and lots of zeros that exploits a mathematical property um, of ECDSA. Um, so if you, if, if you just assume that the R value has a random number of zeros, like the S value has a random number of zeros, um, someone will be able to construct a, an R value that's much shorter <clears throat> and kind of use that to break the scheme. But, we use that property to actually help us. Um, we assume that it is difficult to find an R value that is shorter than the R value that exploits that mathematical property. And so then we use that to assume that the R value is always fixed to be that R value, which is not at all secure from an ECDSA point of view, um, because uh, using the same R value or nonce like leaks out your, your key. So these ECDSA signatures, we're not using them for the ECDSA signing part. We're using them for the um, uh, showing some equivalence to what the hash of the spending transaction is. You may have touched on it in your, in your explanation so far, but maybe make it explicit for me. Um, where does the quantum resistance come in here? Is it just the fact that Lamport signatures themselves are quantum resistant? And so if we are able to add those in some fashion that you, you, you get the quantum resistance or, or maybe connect the dots for me there. Sure. So Lamport signatures are thought to be, um, quantum resistant. Um, if the, uh, if the hash function is safe against quantum attacks, um, <clears throat> And it's generally assumed that hash functions like SHA-256 are. Um, but one thing that we should be very careful about is that while these Lamport signatures are quantum resistant, um, uh, pay to script hash, which is the uh, pre-tap script way that we would have to do this, only has, 100 and, um, only has 80 bits of collision security. Um, and against a quantum computer would only have like 80 bits of pre-image security. <clears throat> so there's probably, while this is technically a quantum resistant scheme due to the number of bits in pay to script hash, it is probably the case that it is, uh, you would not actually want to use this to introduce quantum security into Bitcoin. You could use Lamport signatures to introduce uh, quantum security in, in to Bitcoin uh, in theory, um, but because uh, pay to script hash has uh, a, a small hash output size, it's probably vulnerable to Grover's algorithm. You noted in your mailing list post a series of open questions. And the fifth one here is, is there any use for this beyond a fun party trick? So I saw you know, the, the mailing list post got quite a bit of uh, feedback and discussion from a few individuals have, is there is there anything here beyond a fun party trick you think so that's a that's a really good question and like when i posted it to the mailing list i kind of thought hard of like how can i use this and i was like i can't figure out anything but maybe someone who's you know uh, more clever than me or has some different insight can figure things out um and so as far as i'm aware no one's managed to um uh 
like use this to build um, covenants um, or like use do anything useful with it. Um, but I actually think um, uh, I actually think that um, this is like like this is a neat primitive that you could use in other schemes. So I have some hope that someone will come up with something more than a neat party trick. <clears throat> But I'm actually pretty satisfied with it being like a neat party trick. It's kind of fascinating that you can do this. And it um, asks a bunch of like really interesting questions um, about, you know, like we're making all of these assumptions about ECDSA signatures that are not typically made uh, when thinking about their security. Um, so I, I think there's some hope that people can figure neat things out um, on top of it. But as far as I'm aware, um, no one... As far as I'm aware, the problem is that there aren't sufficient opcodes in um, pre tap script scripts to do bit, bit VM. And then when you go into tap script with bit VM, uh, because snore signatures don't have this size property, they're always like fixed size, essentially, um, where you do you could do bit VM or you could do some op add zero knowledge proof. Um, you don't you don't have these signatures, um, but maybe there's some way to connect outputs. Um, uh, Instagibs actually just asked a question about what uh, what about pay to witness script hash, um, and I hadn't thought of about that. I think pay to witness script hash probably has enough. Um, that's 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 shot 256, right? It's 30 32 bytes, so that probably is that probably is um, uh, quantum secure. Um, uh, in terms of the quantum security of this uh, signature, um, that's interesting. Let me let me think about that some more. Um, uh, I would not use this signature for quantum security because um, we're still trying to figure out if it's secure in the regular world, let alone in the quantum world. Um, but yeah, with paid script, yeah. I'm actually going to pause for a second. Maybe something different. Um, we often see reports about this and that getting better in quantum computers, but there also seems to be a general concern with the noise of the quantum bits. Are you plugged in at all in how far along quantum computers are and when we would actually want to have Lampard signatures? Um, so I am not a uh, quantum computer scientist. Um, so I, 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 I won't answer that question. Um, I think that maybe we want, I think that there needs to be more work exploring how Bitcoin survives in a world with quantum computers, because I think it is uh, uh, very possible for Bitcoin to do that. Um, I don't know whether Lamport signatures are the, the right approach or not. Um, they are an approach and they're pretty simple to build. Um, but there has to be thoughts given to, um, uh, you know, the fact that uh, TapScript um, has a key, has the key spend path and the key spend path, if you solve the discrete log of it, would always spend it. So like even if you had opcat based Lamport signatures and TapScript, you wouldn't be able to, um, uh, you wouldn't actually be safe because someone could uh, use the quantum computer to determine the, the, the key spend path. Um, so I think it's a really interesting area of research to ask, like, what is the best way to make some of these things quantum secure? Um, but uh, I don't have um, I don't have strong strong opinions on that yet. Thanks, Merch. Did you have any other questions? If I'm honest, I still don't quite understand how the short R comes into play. I think that was maybe. Or at least it wasn't obvious to me from the write-up. Um, I think we used this this sort of um, well-known very small R value, and because it's so super small, we we assumed that it would be hard to find something as small. But that always means that the ECDSA key is leaked because we reuse the same nonce. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and I can provide some intuition about the the R question. So. Um, Imagine that we 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 did not use the short R, um, uh, and there um, essentially what the attacker is trying to do 
like let's say there's like four ECDSA signatures. One of them is 59 bytes. One of them is 58, and the other two are 59. The attacker has to basically be able to generate a signature in that second position that is 58 bytes, um, and the length is both is the addition of the R value and the S value. So the attacker could if we didn't use the short R value, just grind R values until they found a um, signature of that length. Um, so by kind of forcing them to fix the R value, we force them to attack like all the signatures. They can't just like make progress by like brute, brute forcing the first one, which shouldn't actually be that hard, and then make progress by brute forcing the second one. Um, instead, we require them to sort of guess all the signatures at once um, because we constrain them to use uh, only that R value. So it's sort of like a trick of um, fixing that R value um, using the size. Um, uh, but if they had found a R value that's shorter, then they would be able to um, play all sorts of games and, and break the scheme. If they had a quantum computer, they could actually find the smallest possible R value. Um, but that would also allow us to find the smallest possible R value. And so it would be like the attacker would break existing signatures, and then we would use the R values that the attacker used to break those signatures to like um, actually make the scheme more secure. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure I understand why they now have to attack all signatures. Wouldn't they just need to guess the S value? So if they, if they guess the S value... Um, like they should just be able to guess the S value. They should be able to know what the S value is. Um, uh, what they shouldn't be able to do is, um, so yeah, I should be clear. This scheme leaks out your secret, your ECDSA secret key. We're not using the secret key for any security whatsoever. Um, basically what we're using is we're using the S value as a proxy for the um, hash of the spending transaction. And so uh, if, um, if you have multiple signatures um, and they are all um, for the same uh, transaction hash, then um, to change their size, you need to change the transaction hash, which then changes all your signatures. Um, so so like you could think about it like picking a lock rather than them being able to pick the pins one at a time to um, uh, to like re-randomize and try to find the ones of the right length that line up. They have to change the transaction hash and then that will force them to recalculate all their signatures, which will have all different sizes. Did that explain your question? Uh, I'm still confused, but some, let me try maybe to explain it back to you. Um, we use the special R value and the S value is derived from the transaction hash uh, or the transaction commitment i should say and at least that's the term that we are trying to push with mastering bitcoin <laughs> and the um uh, r value and since the r value is essentially known the s is basically also known uh, but it is still hard to produce a transaction commitment um and uh because uh, how does it commit to the Lampert signature or something? Or so, so it's like the attacker should be able to just create these signature, create these ECDSA signatures at will. Um, what the the difficulty that the attacker faces is creating an ECDSA signature of length um, uh, fifty eight or of length fifty nine in a particular position. So if you had like four signatures. Um, they might be able to get a 58 length signature in the first position, um, but they wouldn't have it in the second position. And the thing that we've signed would like, basically we sign a statement. We do a Lamport signature of the positions that the, um, the positions uh, that have the 58 length sign ECDSA signature. And so the attacker has to create a transaction hash that has the right length in each one of those positions. Um, uh, and so the attacker can create ECDSA signatures at will. The secret keys leaked out um, so they can just like sign as much as they want. But it should be computationally difficult for them 
to if you just imagine that they're getting the lengths in random positions to line up those random positions with the positions that that uh, we have the the permissions that we've signed with the Lamport signature. I I think I need to stare at this a little more. Um, I did invite Dave though, who I just saw come online. So if he has any questions, um, he he might um, be more versed in this because he did the write up. Uh, that's it from me, Mike. Gloria, I see you've joined. Thanks for joining us. I'm not sure if you have taken a look at anything that Ethan has proposed or, or spoken about uh, in this spaces, but you're welcome to comment on it if you have. Very interesting. I just got back from vacation, so I don't have any comments right now, but I'm going to give it a read. Excellent. Well, if Dave jumps on, he can ask some questions. Uh, Ethan, anything that you would say to the audience as we wrap up this news item? I think if uh, if if this scheme does not make uh, sense to you at first, um, like it didn't make sense to me at first either. Um, it's it's very strange, um, but it's also just very fun. There's something that I find like there's some some stuff that I do that I'm like, OK, well, like it's more of a chore. But this this just feels like such a fun scheme that it might be worth just like figuring out how it works because you'll you'll like you'll kind of like laugh at uh the fact that it works at all i see reardon code in here maybe reardon code wants to to hack on this on this idea he's got a lot of those things juggling around in his brain uh ethan you're welcome to stay on as we move through the rest of the newsletter otherwise if you have other things to do we understand and you're free to drop awesome uh thanks so much thanks for having me on gloria do you want to do a quick introduction for folks who may not be familiar with you? Uh, sure. I'm Gloria. I work on Bitcoin Core, sponsored by Brink. Thanks for joining us today, Gloria. Uh, we have a PR review club, and you are the author and host. The title of the PR is Index TX Orphanage by WTX ID Allow Entries with Same TX ID. Gloria, you're the author as well as host of this PR review club that we highlighted this month. So thanks for joining us to explain this PR. The PR seems to make improvements to Bitcoin Core's transaction orphanage data structure. Maybe a place to start for the discussion would be what is the transaction orphanage and maybe we can get into the improvements you are proposing here. Sure, yeah. And I think this might make more sense after we describe the PR, which is, I think, two or three items below this one on the newsletter. Um, so I, I don't know if, I don't want to, you know, do a last minute change. No, we can do that. Out there. How about, uh, real quick, we have a, a speaker request and then we can maybe jump out of order if, if it makes uh, sense for explaining things. Everything Satoshi, do you have a question or comment? Hi guys. Um, pleasure to be here. I actually had a quick question for Gloria before we jump into the PR review. Um, and the question is... Uh, so recently, there's a video of Gloria on the What Bitcoin Did podcast. I don't know how recent the video is, but I had a quick question, sort of clarification from um, the podcast. And the question is, um, you made a very good point in um, for people who run um, old nodes, old software, um, as a, your reason being uh, security bugs and whatnot. Um, so the question is, for people who do run old versions, just for um, the sake of, you know, storing the time chain, <coughs> excuse me, all of the transactions and all and whatnot from maybe 10, 20, 12 years ago, um, would you still discourage that? Um, as a result of the security bugs, or would you prefer that they they do that at their own risk? I guess then uh, that's a quick question, and I probably can go down. I think generally, from a security perspective, it's not a great idea to run unmaintained software. I think that goes for pretty much anyone using any kind of software. Um, so yeah, you use at your own risk. I wouldn't recommend it. Go ahead, Merch. 
Uh, yeah, I wanted to chime in on this one as well. Um, basically, the problem with software development is even if the software was all correct back when it was created, everything around the software that you're deploying also shifts, right? So you might have updated your operating system since some of the libraries that uh, got used in the old version are, have updated their versions. You might be using a new compiler, meanwhile, to compile your C++ code and so forth. So even if the software would have been perfect and bug-free in the context of when it was published, it might have new interactions with other libraries and software that you're running, and there might be bugs now in how it is executed. Or um, there have been bugs in that version, and they've been fixed since, but we only maintain the latest two versions of Bitcoin Core, uh, the two major releases, and uh, some security issues are uh, fixes for those are backported to older versions, but generally anything that's significantly outdated may or may not be uh, buggy by now. So if you're running really, really old software, uh, that's the risk you're running, and nobody is going back and, and running all these very old versions with new operating systems in the context of new libraries or anything like that. So you'd just be sort of um, a completely uncommon case, and you might be affected by issues that only affect you in this very uncommon case. Jumping back to the newsletter, Gloria, the PR Review Club that we have in, I guess, sequential order of the newsletter is actually, I guess, in a, a potential improvement or a robustness on some of the PRs that we highlight later in the newsletter, um, of which you are the author of all of these. Um, so maybe starting with uh, 28,970 and 30,012, do you want to talk about one parent, one child um, package relay with some limitations, and then we can get into the optimizations from the PR review club. Yeah, sure. Thank, thanks for uh, being flexible. I just felt like it would make more sense here. There's almost like a you know a one parent one child relationship between the PRs. Um, so twenty eight nine seventy is I think pretty exciting. I think it's a big win. It's the first thing that we can really call quote unquote package relay um, that we've merged into core. Uh, from a behavior perspective, I mean. So as a user, this is the first time I have a PR where I can say, hey guys, now if you have a one SAT per VBYTE transaction and you know the mempool or your mempool and everyone else's mempool fills up because there's a lot of transactions um, and they start purging lower fee rate stuff, including your one SAT per VBYTE transaction, you can now attach one child to it to CPFP it um, above that mempool minimum fee rate, and it might propagate. And I say might because there are you know scenarios in which it's not going to work, particularly if there are adversaries trying to purposefully uh, get your transaction to not be accepted um, or if, you know, things are not working super well or if there's, you know, it's not 100% reliable and there are quite a few things that we're trying to do to make it more reliable. Um, so I have a node that's running this right now. It's actually, it's not just default size, which is 300 megabytes. It's actually 150. Um, and I get, I get one stop per VBYTE transactions with their CPFPs. I'd say I see like two to 300 of these packages per hour. Um, and I think last time I checked, it's, I tried to pull up my node, but it's taking a bit longer than I expected. Uh, like 70 to 80% of the transactions that I accept via package evaluation um, end up getting confirmed. Um, and so even though that's an argument to say, even though I have a 150 megabyte mempool and it's not as big as like the giant mempool space one, I still get quite a bit of use out of that space. Um, and I'm still seeing a lot of the, you know, low fee rate, fee bump transactions. Um, and I'm accepting them, you know, when they come out in a block, I already have them in my mempool, you know, I get those compact block relay hits. 
Um, so from a node operator perspective, it's useful. And of course, for a transactor's perspective, you can fee bump your one set per B byte transactions. So that's very exciting. Um, the way that it works is it's opportunistic. So there's no peer-to-peer -peer protocol change that's happened, even though you know we have <laughs> things that we've proposed and actually the bit 331 just got um, merged last week or two weeks ago. Um, so, you know, that, that's all still working, but we've kind of optimized for this one parent, one child case, and it was fairly simple to uh, to get this code merged. So opportunistically kind of detects when you have a low fee rate parent, so it failed mempool validation because it was below the mempool minimum fee rate, and when it detects a transaction that's missing inputs, as in you tried to look up the UTXOs and the UTXO set on the mempool and it wasn't there. Um, and that happens to match with the transaction that was low fee rate. Um, so we'll kind of intelligently match these things together and try to submit them opportunistically. And that is enough for us to get these, you know, one parent, one child packages. Um, it makes use of, so this is where we talk about the PR Review Club PR, if, if that's okay if I continue on to that. Um, yeah, okay. So it uses the orphanage, and you, you previously asked, Mike, what an orphanage is. Um, so <laughs> when we receive a transaction, we might look up its UTXOs and see that they're missing, right? Um, and this can happen in just normal operation, even if everybody is doing you know, exactly what they're supposed to, where let's say there's a parent and a child transactions, um, and you just happen to download the child before the parent, let's say because you requested them from two different peers and one of them just happens to be faster than the other. Um, and so you receive the child first, and because you haven't seen the parent yet, it'll be missing a UTXO. But just from a bandwidth saving perspective, um, since we know that this can happen, it is like often, again, like we can be opportunistic and just be like, all right, I'm going to hold on to this transaction. It's missing a parent. So I consider an orphan transaction and I put it in the TX orphanage. Um, and as soon as that parent comes in, we accept it. And then we can go ahead and look in our orphanage and be like, oh, okay, we have all the, you know, we have a child that corresponds to this transaction and we'll submit it um, again with the one parent, one child PR 28970. Um, we additionally will try to submit them together, not just after the parent has been accepted. Also, if the parent has a low fee rate. Um, and yeah, so we have this orphanage. It in practice is a data structure that kind of looks like a map from TXID to a transaction, along with some information like which peer sent it to us and when it's, you know, how long we've had it effectively so that we can expire them after some time. Um, and we also keep track of kind of like what UTXOs each one spends uh, just for quicker lookup uh, in case we, we want to know that information. Um, but the orphanage is kind of like a best effort data structure. Uh, we, we've never kind of tried to make guarantees with, yeah, we're you know, definitely going to make sure that if we get an orphan, we absolutely 100 percent, you know, as long as it's honest, we'll always keep it. Um, we, we've never made guarantees like that. Um, and that's kind of partially because it, it, it's not really in the in the critical path, critical path, you would say. Um, so. Any transaction uh, in a in a release version today, for Bitcoin Core at least, should be if, you know as long if you download them in the right order, you should you should accept them. But kind of with this opportunistic package relay stuff, um, you need to like the child needs to be in the orphanage at some point in order for you to end up accepting these transactions. Right, because the parents too low fee rate, um, and kind of the only say critical path, the only code path we have we can go through uh, in order to accept these transactions is through orphanage, um, and so that kind of places more responsibility on our orphanage data structure and our orphan handling logic to really treat these transactions with a little bit more care, to uh, try a bit harder to guarantee 
that that it's it's not it doesn't have the problems uh, that it has. So anyway, uh, we we've been talking for years that you know the the TX orphanage has these problems where an adversary can pretty easily attack it, um, and we we've considered this pretty low priority because. Again, you you shouldn't really need the orphanage for regular quote unquote regular transactions, um, but now with this package relay stuff, as well as the designs that we've made for more generalized package relay, the orphanage becomes a bit more important. Um, and so there's some low hanging fruit as well as some kind of slightly more complex orphanage buffs that we want to put in. Okay, and so this PR Review Club PR is about the fact that we index orphanage by TXID. Um, so, of course, if you know you're familiar with Stegwit, um, TXID and WTXID are different. The TXID just commits to the non-witness data, so the inputs, the outputs, the version, etc. Um, it doesn't commit to the witness. Um, so you can have different transactions that have the same TXID but different witnesses, and this is this is a feature. Um, but it, you can also imagine it having problems. So, for example, if I see a transaction uh, with you know with you know the signatures in and witnesses, if I take that signature out, um, or if I replace the signatures with some garbage data, um, the transaction has the same TXID but a different WTXID. So this is where you can kind of imagine things going wrong if you're trying to mess with the orphanage. So I know you're only going to put one transaction per TXID in your orphanage, right? Um, and let's say there's a package that I really want to censor because, I, I don't know, it's it's my counterparty's package. I'm trying to steal money from them. Um, and so when I see this child come through, I'm going to malleate it. I'm, you know, I'm going to take out the signature, put garbage, maybe I'll make it completely, you know, very different. And I'll send you that transaction. Um, and what's going to happen is even if there's an honest party that sends you that child, um, you are going, you might, you you're going to be like, okay, this is an orphan. Am I going to put it in my orphanage? Oh, I already have it. Drop it on the ground, um, and that and that's really unfortunate, because I've just kind of blocked you from downloading and keeping that correct child. Um, and so, obviously, there is a way to resolve this, right? Like when you go to actually validate things, you're going to be like, "Oh, this child's invalid," and you're going to drop it. But then you need another peer, another honest peer, to send you that those two transactions again. Um, and you know, typically, nodes are not going to tell everybody everything twice. Um, and so this, you know, it's, it's not guaranteed that you're going to, to lose this transaction, um, but it's also, it lowers the probability that you're going to end up accepting it quite, uh, quite badly. Um, and of course I can send you yet another, you know, malleated version of that child. Right. Um, and so this is an example of kind of a, a very active adversary trying pretty hard to, to censor transactions, but it is kind of, something that we want to avoid. So this trend, this PR, sorry, just first of all, replaces the map to be by WTXID instead of by TXID and allows the orphanage to have multiple transactions um, that are, that are, that have the same TXID, um, which obviously only one of them is valid, but, you know, because it's kind of this, this data structure that you, you're going to use to house transactions from many peers, which may or may not be honest, and you have no idea which one is the correct one, um, it, 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 is, it makes sense for you to keep multiple. Yes, Merch, you have a question. No, I have a correction. Wouldn't it be possible to have two valid children? Uh, for example, with um, pay to tap root inputs, you can have either the script path spent or the key path spent. And while unlikely, it could be possible that someone first used a script path to spend and then whoever they were signing with came back online and they, then they instead created another transaction with the key path uh, spend so they could both be valid. Yes, sure. Sorry. I meant that only ultimately only one of them is going to end up on chain. But yeah, they, they could both be like consensus valid transactions, definitely. Um, but only ultimately only one of them is going to be useful to you. 
um, if, if that makes any sense. But yeah, and, and you can have replacements uh, of the same transaction. Um, oh, well, I guess those th- those would have different TXIDs, or they can. They, they, well, they could also be one, one is slightly smaller than the other. Um, but anyway, yes, it, you, you are correct that they can both be valid. Um, but yeah, I mostly meant that only one of them is useful. Uh, all right, let, let me maybe just quickly recap. So the problem that we are addressing here is when we first see a transaction, we don't know necessarily whether it's going to be a valid transaction or what fee rate it pays if we don't know the parent transactions because we can only calculate the total fees spent if we know the inputs and the inputs might not have been created from our perspective yet because we haven't seen the parent transaction. So we don't know the value of the outputs on the parent transaction, therefore don't know the fees, therefore the cannot make any determinations about the transaction for which we don't know the inputs. So we stuff it in our orphanage and wait to see all the parents in order to be able to fully uh, validate the transaction. And there is a, as far as I know, mostly theoretical attack vector here where an active attacker will give us a malleated uh, witness to a transaction and makes us store that in the orphanage because we can't validate the transaction without the parent. And then if we see the actual valid transaction later, we would throw it away because it matches on the DX ID. You you fix this by indexing on the witness TX ID instead of the TX ID. So far, so good. Um, So, yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought you're continuing from here. <laughs> oh, no, I just wanted to say that, yeah, that that's correct. <laughs> All right, cool. And now to tie this back to the one parent, one child, this is especially useful in the context of having stuff in our orphanage already, uh, because let's say someone is trying to close a lightning channel, uh, the commitment transaction has a pre-negotiated fee rate, which may currently be below the dynamic minimum mempool fee rate. So they can't actually broadcast the commitment transaction because it's too low fee rate and therefore they cannot see PFP the commitment transaction because the child transaction would propagate, but it would propagate without the parent and without the parent, it cannot be validated. So it ends up in an orphanage. But now with your prior change 28970, you will uh, look up in the orphanage, hey, this um, parent transaction that I'm trying to validate that has too low of a fee rate, does it happen to have a child that's currently waiting in the orphanage? And if I package them together, they pass the dynamic minimum mempool fee rate and go in. So that's that's the broader context recap too. <laughs> Gloria, I have a question. Before 28.970, and we note this in the write-up in the newsletter, that the peer would notice that the parent's fee rate was too low and refuse to accept it. So does that mean now that I'm going to be still trying to hand low-fee parents out to my peers and and, uh, if they don't support uh, 28.970, that that they're going to penalize me for that because I'm giving them something below their fee filter settings potentially, or maybe explain the the interplay between the fee filter settings in a, in a peer saying, I don't want anything below this fee rate and me then now hand handing them parents with low fee rates. Sure. So I'll explain the fee filter thing first, and then I'll talk about what happens before and after 2970. So the fee filter message you will send to your peers, which is kind of an approximation of your minimum fee rate. It's it's approximated because uh, otherwise it can be a bit of a privacy issue. Um, and also like your own knowledge of your minimum fee rate is not exact either. I don't know. Anyway, um, and so you'll just say, hey, don't announce these transactions to me because I'm not going to take them anyway. And there's no penalty for announcing or sending those transactions anyway. I, I think it's actually a bit more of a bandwidth savings on the transaction sender side. 
Um, and so there's there's absolutely no penalty or discouragement or anything for uh, quote unquote violating the speed filter. It's it's more of just like a friendly message. Um, and so actually, before twenty eight nine seventy, we would be sending the parent anyway. Um, so because when you receive a transaction where you're missing the inputs, it's an orphan, right? Um, you're going to request the parents from the transaction, uh, from the peer that sent you that transaction. Um, and the fee filter is only used in announcements. It's not used in like, oh, oh, you asked me for this transaction. Yeah, I'll send it to you. That We don't apply the fee filter there. Um, so before it's like the amount of parent requesting and parent sending actually doesn't really change um, with with this PR. <laughs> it's just that before it was like definitely totally useless where <laughs> where they'd send you the, the low fee rate parent and you wouldn't accept it. Um, and now you might. Uh, so, yeah, there's there's the clarification. Yeah, it's it's not. The fee filter message is we're not penalizing anyone for it. And actually, uh, we we were already wasting that bandwidth before. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And there's some good nuggets of knowledge in there. And we talked about the PR Review Club, which is 30,000, which adds some robustness to this one parent, one child um, implementation. And then we also noted in the newsletter uh, that there is a follow-up PR that may potentially add additional robustness to this protocol by giving each peer sort of their own portion of the orphanage. Is that right, Gloria? Yeah, essentially, uh, like I said before, the orphanage is shared amongst all our peers. Um, and we, we don't try to give we don't try to guarantee any peer that they have you know a certain amount of locker space in the orphanage and so if if one adversary is just sending orphans over and over and over and over again um we evict them randomly as well so we we might just end up kicking everybody's useful orphans out like I said, the orphanage is not really considered a robust data structure, and we haven't made it a priority to change that. Um, but now we are. So yeah, the follow-up PR that you mentioned, 27742, adds kind of a token bucket mechanism um, where I think it was outbound peers only. So outbound versus inbound peers. Uh, outbounds we control, whereas inbounds you can imagine adversaries you know, they could, they could take up 10 slots of your inbounds. They could take up, a, they could just make connections to you to try to attack you. So outbound peers would receive a certain amount of quote unquote protected orphans. Um, so we, you know, each token, let's say is worth, you know, a hundred bytes or a thousand bytes of storage in orphanage. Um, and so Anytime an uh, outbound peer sends us an orphan and we're, you know, we're trying to do package relay with them, then we will see if they have any tokens to spend on protecting those orphans. And, and so we'll protect those orphans from eviction. Um, so, you know, if our orphanage fills up in space, we will evict everything else, um, but not the protected orphans. And then if this orphan turns out to be useful, i.e. we accept it to mempool, then those protection tokens are replenished. If the orphan turns out to be invalid, then we take those tokens away. Um, and so if a peer is misbehaving, or even if they just have kind of, you know, different policy, for example, um, then the amount of protection they receive will decrease over time. Um, and whereas the, the ones that we do have the same policy with or are sending us valid orphans, um, they'll always have a, a good amount of, of tokens that they can use. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a high level overview of, of what that PR does to try to buff up orphanage. There's some others as well. Really, these aren't merged, by the way. So maybe we should wait until these are merged to, <laughs> to talk about on the recap. <laughs> yeah, we, we could probably get deeper when, when it actually happens, but I just wanted to uh, give a little sneak preview for everyone. Merch, did you have a question? Yeah, but I guess we're not going deeper at this time. <laughs> Gloria, we didn't touch on 30,012, but it looks like that's just maybe some uh, follow-ups to 
28, 970 and, and nothing worth digging in there specifically? Yeah, it's mostly just follow-ups. I don't, don't know if there's anything okay. exciting in here. Great. Well, Merch or Gloria, anything else interesting from our combination PR review club 28, 970 and 30,012 that we should wrap up before we move on? I, I just I'm want to hide. I'm sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, you go first. <laughs> Mine's. I, I just want to highlight again how cool it is that uh, even without any P2P message changes, we can now propagate one parent, one child. Uh, sure, only opportunistically, but as long as nobody is churning our orphanage, we should probably have a pretty good success rate here. So anyway, this is super cool. I agree. I just wanted to do my victory lap of getting PR number 30,000. <laughs> Now, did you did you you can admit it here? Where the the Optech recap is a safe safe place. Were were you, were you waiting for thirty thousand? I I was, um, and then I gave up. <laughs> but but then um, I I went to open the PR and I happened to get it. So yes and no. All right, Gloria, you're you're welcome to to hang on. We got a couple more Bitcoin Core PRs and a couple releases, but obviously you have a lot going on. And if you have to drop, we understand. Jumping back up, releases and release candidates. We have two this week. First is LibSecP 0.5.0 release. It includes improvements to key generation and signing algorithms, increasing the speed of both. We covered that PR last week with LibSecP P uh, 1058 and noted a 12% speed improvement. This release also adds a new function that sorts public keys using lexicographic order. And also noted in the release from the authors was that the SecP binary is also a lot smaller now, which the authors expect would be beneficial to embedded users of the library particularly. Anything to add on that release, Merch? Yeah, uh, the lexicographic order of pub keys, I think, is used both by silent payments and by music. So that's how it got in there. And um, yeah, that, that's all I have. Second release is one that's been on for a week or two, which is the LND 0.18.0 beta RC1 release candidates. We have covered a bunch of these LND related PRs here over the last few months. If you just cannot wait, you can go back and try to figure out which of those are going to be in this release. But um, I think we'll jump more into detail on this release once the release is final. And I'm outreaching at the moment already to LND folks. Hopefully we can get somebody on to walk us through all the highlights. So stay tuned on that. Notable code and documentation changes. We've touched on a couple already. I'll take the opportunity. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the, the space chat here in the thread or request speaker access. Skipping down now to Bitcoin Core 2816, which begins waiting for all seed nodes to be pulled before pulling DNS seeds. Merch, I have some notes here, but I think you've spoken with the PR author, so maybe I'll let you have a take at it, and, unless you want me to go. Yeah, I'll, I'll try. So uh, this pull request uh, addresses an issue where if you configure your node to use a seed node, which is basically a, a node designated to be asked for new addresses of peers first, um, so far, what has been happening is if you didn't have seeds in your um, tried table and uh, new table yet in your adder man, you would eventually ask the DNS seeds and at the same time then also ask the seed node. My understanding is that DNS seeds are super fast to respond because that's their entire purpose and they'll just immediately give you a whole list of peers. And the seed node might actually be droned out by the DNS seed response. And because they happen in parallel, the DNS seeds would usually serve you new addresses more quickly than the designated seed node that you configured. So what this change does is if you do configure a seed node, uh, A, 
you will always ask this node for new addresses when you uh, start your uh, node, but uh, it'll also give a head start to the seed node before asking DNS seeds if there is uh, nothing in your adder man. So I, I believe it's a 30 second head start for the seed node. So you will first uh, query the the peer that is designated to be queried for to ask for new addresses before you ask seed nodes uh, with a 30 second head start and that should give you a bunch of addresses already before you hear from the DNS seeds all those long lists. Um, yeah, that that's roughly what I understood this PR to do. Question for you, Merch and or Gloria, who who may know it. What is a fixed seed, which would be the which would be something that triggers after one minute? So we sort of have the the seed node with the head start, and then the DNS seed, and then fixed seed after a minute. Anybody know what fixed seeds are? Okay. Merch, do you want to take it or? No, no, no. You go ahead. Oh, it's just. It's just the address of someone that we know, like, for example, who is probably going to be running a node. <laughs> uh, I mean, fixed seeds are really hard because, um, like, wh when we write this, it's going to be hard-coded in the code, right? And like March mentioned before, this code is going to be supposedly maintained for about two years after its first release. Um, so it's really difficult to know who's going to be running Fix uh, who's going to be running nodes in um, in two years, which, which is why Fixseed is kind of the the last resort in terms of who you're going to connect to when you're starting up. That's it. Okay, that makes sense. So it sounds like we have three buckets. I, I could provide my own seed nodes individually. Uh, otherwise, DNS seeds are queried. If that somehow fails, there's just uh, I guess. IP addresses, or, or I guess depending on the network, addresses that are, are known to, to run Bitcoin nodes as like a very last resort. Got it. Cool. Thanks, Gloria and Merch. Last PR this week is Bitcoin Core 29623, titled Simplify Network Adjusted Time Warning Logic. In newsletter 288, we covered PR 28956, which was the PR that actually removed adjusted time from validation code. And in News 284, we covered a PR review club about that PR. And essentially what that PR 28956 did was um, this notion of adjusted time. It's actually called nuke adjusted time, that PR. But it made just adjustments to a local node's time based on the reported time of its peers, its network peers. But this adjusted time historically led to some problems in the past and was determined not to provide any meaningful benefits to nodes these days. So 28956 removed the notion of adjusted time based on your peers' time and replaced that adjusted time with a warning to the node operator that if the node appeared to be out of sync with the network, they got some messages informing them of such. So that was all 28,956. Great, so what does this 29,623 do? This picks up where um, 28,956 le left off in terms of 28,956 actually made some concessions to make review easier. And so this PR that we're covering this week actually takes into account some of the refactors that were intended for that original PR to refactor and simplify that code and separate it out into its own separate PR. A couple of things that I saw in the calculation logic included changing the warning clock out of sync threshold to 10 minutes. So if you're more than 10 minutes out, you'll get a warning. It, uh, this PR adds additional warnings to the user through a variety of means. There's an RPC warning, I believe, a GUI warning, etc. Additionally, removes the startup argument titled max time adjustment and also changes the offset calculation to be a rolling calculation based on peers, um, I think 50 peers, instead of previously it was the first 199 outbound peers that you connected to that you used for calculating the offset. So this PR this week was essentially in included a bunch of those maybe refactors or simplifications that weren't included in the original one for ease of review. Gloria, I think you were a reviewer on one or more of these mentioned PRs. Um, do you have anything that you'd add or 
correct based on that? Sure. Yeah, it's definitely a simplification and it does some pretty nice cleaning up. I say the only tragic thing is it removes my favorite line of Satoshi code, which is the comment saying, never go to sea with two chronometers, 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 (laughs) never go to sea with two, take one or three. I'm a bit sad to see that go, but it's it's a good cleanup. It's a good PR. <laughs> That's funny. I, I yeah, I've seen that that quoted elsewhere. I didn't realize that this 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 killed that. So R.I.P. Satoshi comment. Merch, anything that you'd add? I I saw that there's a fast test being added, so we'll add some QA assets to that and fuzz it hard for a week or so. All right. I don't see any questions or requests for speaker access. So thanks to Ethan for joining us. Thanks to Gloria for your question. And I think it was everything sats for your question is is what I meant. And Gloria for your opining on Bitcoin Core PRs in the review club. Always great to hear you explain these things. And thanks always to my co-host Merch.